Carol and Matriciana. In the 60s, there was a massive shift in new thinking that was taking place through an entire generation, basically through the introduction of drug use. Its altered states of consciousness introduced the idea that personal experiences achieved through expanded consciousness were more relevant than the old way of thinking based on absolute truths and objective thinking. The English rock band The Beatles and other celebrities championed philosophies from the East promoted by Eastern mystic teachers of the religion of India. These men are called gurus or god men and introduced millions in the hippie counterculture to the Eastern mystical idea of enlightenment. The idea that you could connect through a spiritual experience to the god spark that was believed to reside within each person. This worldview was in complete opposition to the traditional conservative religious view that based its authority in the Bible and God's word being ultimate truth. Eastern mysticism debunked a personal God that was outside time and space and said this Eastern religious experience could be tuned into, which was opposite to the idea of a personal God being able to be reached through faith, through Jesus Christ, who came to be the salvation for man's sin. In fact, Eastern mysticism doesn't even believe in man being a sinner, but rather that man is ignorant of his divine self, his innate divinity. Also, as 60s drug culture and Eastern enlightenment was exploding, a sexual revolution was mushrooming. Huge rock concerts like the Woodstock Music Festival at a 600-acre farm in New York State accommodated 500,000 hippies at what was known as a three-day love-in, where sex, illegal drug use, and Eastern mysticism were part of the indulgences. Added to the changeover of new thinking and shifting values came the groundbreaking musical theater, Hair, the American Tribal Love Rock Musical. Across America and Europe, actors and actresses danced and sang through the message of Hair, its uh, political activism against the Vietnam War, its pacifism and the peace movement. Its catchy songs in the 60s perpetuated the madness of the 60s, the illicit drug use, sexuality, and Eastern spirituality, singing about reincarnation and yoga, synonymous with Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga and no yoga without Hinduism. Hare's world-famous anthem song, The Dawning of a New Age of Aquarius, introduced millions to the occult philosophy of looking to the stars, the moon, and the sun for answers to peace, love, harmony, and understanding. According to esoteric teaching, the age of Aquarius is a new age of spirituality based on esoteric mysticism and inner spiritual awareness. Also, during this age of Aquarius, it is believed that a great spiritual teacher was going to come not only in physical form to bring in world peace, but also in a spirituality where he would manifest himself to all those seekers seeking for his inner teachings. What we call the New Age Movement began to have a mass effect for the first time in the decade of the 1960s. Uh, for the first time, large numbers of uh, predominantly young people started to experiment with drugs, uh, particularly LSD, which produced very mystical states of awareness. This led many in what was called the youth uh, movement back then, a slang term would be the hippie movement, to uh, experiment with Eastern mysticism, many of them moved from uh, drug-induced uh, mystical aspect to a meditation-induced mystical aspect, that meditation replaced LSD. The young people of the 60s, and I would be among them, 
were delighted and they took to drugs. LSD gave them experiences that were unimagined at that time. An encounter with, with a spiritual reality that seemed to fill that vacuum and that desperate need for an encounter with the divine. And it had nothing to do with dogma and it had nothing to do with Christianity. They began to realize that there was something far more to this and when the Beatles began to bring in an experimentation, they became fascinated with the Guru movement. They're the ones who are responsible for bringing Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in, as well as really endorsing and giving a new platform to the Guru famous for the Hare Krishna chant that at that time was prevalent on every street corner. But they began to realize something else that was fascinating, that drugs were just an, an opening, a first step. They began to realize as they were practicing these techniques of ancient Hindu occultism brought in by the gurus, brought in by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and his transcendental meditation, that they were having the same kinds of experiences they'd initially had on drugs. They were encountering mystical beings and seeing a whole new dimension of mind that opened them to the possibilities that had never before been considered by so many people all at once. And when they realized that, they moved primarily from a drug-induced stupor and experience to an understanding that without drugs, without the hallucinogens, they could have the same kinds of experiences and meet the same beings which the shamans of the ancient pagan religions had been encountering through the use of drugs for millennia. In the 1960s, uh, the Western world went through a very uh, profound metamorphosis. There was a total change, uh, the way people looked at life, the way they looked at society. There was an explosion of interest in uh, making the world a better place, idealism, and many people uh, thought that LSD was the key to this uh, transformation, it's particularly young people. But after a while, there was another emphasis. See, LSD was illegal. You know, you could go to jail for taking LSD. But meditation was perfectly legal. You know, you can meditate and have the same experiences without uh, breaking the law. Timothy Leary at the time was a professor in Harvard, and he was busy with a number of other professors doing experimentation on a new drug, a mind-altering concoction that we've come to know as LSD. And he decided this was the perfect vehicle to help unleash and to bring people into an awareness of their inner divinity, of their unity with the cosmos. Many of the professors who had been responsible for introducing these illegal drugs onto the campuses and experimenting with a whole generation of young people uh, whom they exposed to LSD began to suddenly realize that they didn't need to be using these drugs to achieve these incredible ecstatic experiences. One professor in particular, Richard Alpert, while interviewing a Hindu guru, decided to throw over his entire career, the direction of his life, and he himself became a guru known as Baba Ram Das and became an extremely popular author who helped promote Eastern mysticism in this country and in the West. In India, where I grew up for 20 years, the term guru takes on huge religious significance. He's not only a divine teacher, but one who has all knowledge, all wisdom, all understanding, and can introduce his pupil into self-actualization, or the idea that within him is the divine spark. Only guru is said to destroy the darkness in his devotee and take him into true spiritual illumination or the recognition of his own divinity. According to the Guru Gita, the sacred writings of Hinduism, he who bestows that nature which transcends the qualities is said to be Guru. In other words, Guru awakens dormant spiritual knowledge and liberates the soul to achieve salvation through a mind experience called an awakening. One Hindu mystic, Brahmananda, said Guru's glory is greater than God. Dr. Richard Alpert, who uh, was a, a professor, I think, at Harvard University, was an advocate of LSD. He gave LSD to a Hindu guru 
And then after uh, it was supposed to take effect, he asked him, well, what do you think? Well, the guru said, you know, he didn't notice any difference. So this led Dr. Alpert to believe that this guru was always in the same state of consciousness as one was in during an LSD experience. So Dr. Alpert changed his name to Baba Ram Das, uh, embraced Hinduism, wrote a book called Be Here Now, and this book became one of the Bibles of the counterculture in the 1960s, leading you know huge numbers of people to embrace Hinduism and Buddhism. By the decade of the 60s, the society had become extremely pragmatic. We had seen the success of materialism in a generation that believed science was going to provide the solution to all avail the ills of mankind. We were going to bring the healing for cancer and for all of the diseases. We were going to put a man on the moon. In fact, we did. We were going to see science provide all of the solutions. And yet, one solution it did not provide was a filling of that vacuum, that emptiness that had been left by a pragmatic approach even to religion. With all of the removal of the myths of the Bible in the early 1900s, the churches had become dispensers of a Christianity that dealt more with the great he used to be than the great I am. And especially the young people of that age were desperate for spiritual reality. Materialism was cool, it provided everything they wanted, but they had a sense there was something more to be experienced. And that vacuum had to be filled by something. The Woodstock Music Festival was the perfect venue for hundreds of thousands of hippies in the 60s who were searching for spiritual and emotional fulfillment. A Hindu godman, Swami Sachidananda, opened Woodstock and gave an overwhelming address in which he flaunted Hinduism's religious foundation that the whole universe evolved into existence by the magical and musical vibration of Om. In his famous opening, he said this, music is a celestial sound and it is the sound that controls the whole universe. Such energy, sound power, is much, much greater than any other power in the world. Among Swami Sachidananda's followers were singer-composer Carol King, jazz musician Paul Winter, actors like Jeff Goldblum, and famous pop art artist Peter Max, who was responsible for inviting his guru to Woodstock. In the 1960s, the Woodstock Music Festival uh, contained a uh, very strong New Age element. Uh, the keynote spiritual speaker at that festival was a uh, uh, man uh, called Swami Satchikananda, and he had the 300,000 uh, people chanting Om at that festival. And that's perfectly understandable because if one looks at what the subtitle of, of the Woodstock Festival was, uh, Wood, Woodstock Music Festival, an Aquarian Fair, that was the subtitle. This is the same uh, uh, reference that Alice Bailey talked about, the age of Aquarius. So uh, all these uh, 300,000 people that were attending that uh, festival and were chanting Om had no idea that they were participating in something that had been prophesied by uh, 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 an occult mystic, you know, decades before. It was during this period that the New Age actually began to take hold of, in society in a very serious way. It went from being like a fad to being something that had some kind of permanent uh, uh, element to it. Woodstock's famous Indian guru, Swami Sichidananda, moved permanently to America after his Woodstock appearance, which brought him great prestige. In America, he founded the Integral Yoga Institute, gave hundreds of lectures, authored many books, and translated several interpretations of Hinduism's sacred books, the Bhagavad Gita, and Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. He passed away in 2002 in India, but was famous for his satsangs, or spiritual discourses. He was the first to promote Jesus as an Eastern mystical awareness. He said, remember that Christ is not a person, it's an experience, Christhood, like Nirvana or Buddha, it's an experience. What was one of the rallying cries of the 60s is to question authority, 
Well, that wasn't just in a human sense. That was to question everything, everything that was presented as this is how it is. Uh, spirituality was going to be on that chopping block as well. So whether it was the altering of drugs and the hallucinogenics and all of the, the psychedelic things of the 60s and the drugs and all the rest, in the midst of all of that, you had them questioning all types of authority, not just parents, but the clergy, the church, the Bible, everything that there is about that, that whole uh, era of time was the counterculture. And you can't trust anyone, so make your own reality. Well, that fell over into the 70s and then into the 80s. And as we've gone on through the generations, what we have now with us is still, we're still questioning authority. But now we're bringing into the crosshairs, we're looking at the Bible and says, it has no power to judge me. It has no power to tell me right and wrong. Don't you tell me what I'm supposed to think. Who is God that he would say such a thing? The Bible's corrupt. I reject it. There were a number of gurus who had a very serious impact on middle-class society in the Western world. One of them, of course, was uh, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Uh, between uh, 1974 and 1976, 700,000 people in the United States enrolled in transcendental meditation classes. And for the most part, these were not uh, counterculture types. These were like doctors, lawyers, housewives, uh, businessmen, you know, people that were a part of regular society. And I believe that it was during this period that the New Age actually began to take hold of, in society in a very serious way. It went from being like a fad to being something that had some kind of permanent uh, uh, element to it. And again, there were other movements. There was Swami Muktananda and his Siddha Yoga uh, Foundation. Many people uh, became involved with him. There was uh, Yogi Bhajan and his 3HO, Happy, Healthy, Holy uh, organization. There were other spin-off groups that had uh, ties to Eastern mysticism. There was EST, Earhart Seminar Training. There was Silva Mind Control and many lesser known organizations that uh, promoted and trained people in the practice of meditation. I had a very, uh, almost like a mountaintop experience with Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, the Indian guru that I got involved with for some time. One of the very first things that I was taught through the Rajneesh group was, was to how to meditate. We did very specific meditations, but the very first night that I meditated, we did a, a, a meditation that came from India, and I thought it was actually a little bit hokey when I started. We put blindfolds on, there was Indian music, there was sort of a staccato drum beat, and we were led progressively through vigorous action, through cathartic expression, into the silence, and that is that it was deception. It was a spiritual deception, but I didn't know there was deception. I didn't know that the Bible warned us to test the spirits in 1 John 4, 1, that everything that comes at you spiritually is not from God. I personally understand how appealing and how alluring these encounters with the counterfeit God and the counterfeit Jesus can be. When I was practicing Silva Mind Control, it was an organization that was started and researched by a man named Jose Silva in Laredo, Texas, who in an effort to solve educational problems of his children who were having trouble learning, developed a technique of hypnosis, self-hypnosis, and Eastern mysticism that incorporated psychology as principles that would help present an easy technique for accessing what he wanted to believe were the genius potential levels of the mind. It was part of the human potential movement that taught that man is unlimited in his potential. He can evolve to being God. Anthony Robbins, born in 1960, became famous for his human potential involvement principles, his self-help coaching life seminar, and leading hundreds of people barefoot on burning coals in order to achieve their inner potential. He said that they could unleash the power within and do this. He coached numerous celebrities, movie stars, athletes, business corporations and more and authored many books that teach Eastern mystical beliefs couched in human psychological rhetoric. Um, working in the Anthony Robbins organization as a leader and teaching, you know, hundreds to thousands of people that if they uh, focus on the, the positive things that they want in their life, 
and stay focused, stay locked down tight on it and like don't let it go, hold on to it, that you will get it. He teaches us to like at every moment in your life, whether you're in your restroom, you put up like a little sticky um, that says, you know, I'm going to be successful today or, you know, the picture that this is how I'm going to look or dollars, actual cut out dollars and look at money all the time and money will come to you and to put away, you know, what not to think about and just to focus on what you want. And if we just constantly focus on those things, it makes your life easier. You'll be successful. You'll be self-motivated. The emphasis of psychology is that it, it assumes that man is the one who's going to go ahead and bring about the change. Uh, so if we can just understand the mind, we can somehow unlock the ability to fix things ourselves. But the, the Bible tells us uh, in a number of ways, but one of the, the passages that, that Paul talks about, he says, in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So if our operational premise is this, we're fallen by our very nature. And unless God changes us from the inside out, we're incapable of fixing anything. We don't know how to tell the difference between right and wrong. We wouldn't know that there's a God and that he has some standard of what is right and wrong if it wasn't for the pages of scripture. When I was um, working with the Anthony Robbins organization, I was told that it was, you know, psychology of the mind. Actually, the seminar um, for the Anthony Robbins company is called Unleash the Power Within. And that's pretty much what it is. It's to a point where you can have so much self-control within yourself that he does something called the fire walk. And it's actually walking on coals and walking on fire on the first day of being there. It was a cool experience to say, I did it. I am powerful. I can't believe I did it. Oh my gosh, I did it. This is great. I got to share. Now you can do it. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Because you're in control. I know you can do it. It's all about you. And I did it. If I did it, then you can do it. Jose Silva was teaching us how to use our imagination to project it into different things aspects of reality into metals into wood to explore the inner atomic substructure of these things using our imagination and also to be very careful if we were using these techniques on little animals because little birds for example canaries in their cages were found dead after being handled in a rough manner in these psychic dimensions and these unlimited abilities of the mind that we were now learning to use and harness and explore at will. The ultimate proof that we were functioning at this unlimited genius potential of mind was through the carrying out of an exercise that he said, most of you aren't going to believe you can do it, you're going to think it's imagination, but it's real. We're going to teach you how to become a psychic, very much like Edgar Casey, although he didn't use the term psychic. A healer was the term used then. A great wise person who can at a conscious level do what the famed psychic Edgar Casey, who is extremely famous and well known in the 40s and 50s especially, as a man, simple, unassuming man who suddenly found himself going into a trance state and while in this trance state, voices coming through him and presenting unimaginably accurate information and details on individuals from any part of the world. My experience in working in the seminar industry, being in rooms with hundreds of people going through this hypnotic um, mind trance, reconstructing your past, um, I see that God is nowhere to be found in this room. In fact, it is so nowhere to be found that I mean, the lights are out, you're not allowed to leave the room, you're like in a shut down trance and you are not even to think of things involving God at all. In fact, you're actually in total control, redesigning who you are, what you want to be, what you wish happened to you. So basically you are the God of your life. Psychology Today said that the Eastern worldview, Eastern religions would come to the West as a psychology. Somebody say, well, how can that be? Because psychology is not science. It is experiential. It has to do with feelings and moods and understanding. It also teaches uh, bottom line that we are innately good. This is an idea out of Hinduism that we are good. It's just through our ignorance we have gotten ourselves into all kinds of problems and all kinds of trouble. Um, when I became a Bible-believing Christian, born again, um, I found out that the myths and where my 
unhappiness came from is I'm out there telling everyone to go out and you can do it with the power within you. But the truth is God says you can't do it because we are sinners. Jose Silva said there must be a way of helping my children tap into this potential scientifically, not using occultic technologies, but being able to apply these, taking the best parts of these ancient practices of hypnosis and meditation techniques and applying psychological principles that will help them now tap into what electroencephalographs have determined and tell us are the lower brainwave frequencies of mind, the alpha brainwave frequency being the key one that Jose Silva was focusing on in the training center from Silva Method. And the theory being that as you're tapping in to these scientifically verified lower brainwave frequencies, we can do incredibly astonishing things. Develop the genius potential of your mind. That one was very appealing to me. Develop uh, the ability to overcome habits and negative thinking. Develop the ability to learn and memorize anything. Develop other interesting abilities, the ability to heal instantly, to program your sleep for problem solving using what they call the three finger technique, the ability to heal, to lay hands on someone and bring healing to them using the methodology and the techniques that Jose Silva had scientifically presented to us. What they were doing, however, was training psychics. As we were being taught the basic principles of ancient shamanism, which has as its foundation the ability to use your imagination in a creative way through which you can create your reality. Anthony Robbins' um, techniques and tools that he teaches is a combination of your mindset, focusing on things that you want, taking control of your body by doing certain types of movements that give you power, and within that power, it connects with a certain force, like a, like a magic spirit that comes in and helps you take action. We use techniques of imagination, putting yourself in a trance. And then once you're there, um, we extend the imagination by saying, okay, now let's recreate your past. They can recreate what happened to them, meaning all of that stuff, everything you've ever been through no longer exists. And you are you are manifesting your new life, your new upbringing, your new culture, your new religion, whatever you wanted um, in this trance when you are in a hypnotic state where you can actually pick and choose whatever it is you wished your life to be. We can study man's body through physics, chemistry, and so on. What about spirit? What about mind? No, these things are non-physical and they are not subject to the scrutiny of, of science, medical science or anything else, because we don't have we can't put spirituality under a microscope. We can't look at spirituality and come up with laws. There are no laws of spirit that we know are true, as, as we can know with the body. What can science tell us about morality, integrity, aesthetics? These things are outside the realm of science because they are not they don't work by universal laws, by chemical laws, by physical laws, and so on. So when we're talking about morality, we're talking about a spirituality, and that is outside the realm of science. What Silva Mind Control was going to do with us, to prove to us we were now operating at this genius level, was to do the same kinds of things Edgar Cayce did, but at a conscious level. The way we were able to do this was by being taught techniques that are virtually identical to what's being used in the contemplative movement today and in the inner healing movement of today. Movements that teach you how to go within and contact Jesus so that you can have healing and they use techniques of guided imagery visualization. The whole goal with Anthony Robbins is moving forward. Whether you have negative spirits in you or positive, he shows us how to use that energy and turn it into motivating forces to help us take action. They're very cunning and very smooth and they make you feel really good. They put you in a state of mind that you are not bad, you have potential to be really good, and that if you follow these principles, you could actually take in control of who you are and you could actually you know, achieve anything you want in life. Psychology pretends to know the heart of man 
and how we work and how we function. But psychology are just concepts and ideas that men make up. The scripture says only God knows the heart. He knows our thoughts. The church has taken psychology to heart. The most powerful, the most influential individual in evangelical Christianity is not a preacher, not a teacher, but a psychologist, Dr. James Dobson. Uh, his concept of self and self-esteem is no different than what the Hindus teach, self-realization. Bottom line, when you take self and the ideas related to self and self-esteem, it's going to come down to self-deification. Now, I'm not saying Dr. Dobson teaches that, but humanistic psychology, that's at the heart, which is what he teaches, that's at the heart, it's at the root of psychology, psychotherapy, and so on. Our pursuit of knowledge and intellectual understanding has given rise to Christian psychology. We get uh, a lot of modes and methods of how to fix people's psyche. Uh, it's given us the 12-step programs, and uh, a lot of those uh, are Christianized, and they've gone behind or beyond just being uh, for alcoholism. They go into a number of different things, these 12-step programs that have become very, very popular. They're still based upon mode and method. Uh, they leave behind the clear teaching of Scripture and all of the rest of that, uh, and they try to get into how the mind works and that we can somehow change how the mind deals with things. Uh, but see, Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all measure, and who can possibly know it? So psychology's not going to figure out what's wrong with my head. 12-step programs aren't either. What they're going to give me is a mode and a method to try to change my behavior, but they'll never be able to explain it to me. That's the realm of God. Only he's the one who knows those things. Uh, Rick Warren's a big uh, supporter of Celebrate Recovery is one of the, the ones that we see in many, many churches. Um, what it really is, it's, it's become uh, accepted by those churches, but it's very much along the same model of what we saw as the early Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step uh, procedure. Uh, they've changed some of the terminology and all the rest of it, but very similar to AA, uh, really you do nothing more than, than substitute one addiction for another. During my time as a member at Saddleback Church, I was also uh, a part of the Celebrate Recovery program. Uh, I was suffering from an alcohol problem at that time and going to the recovery program there at Saddleback Church. And there was a Celebrate Recovery Bible, uh, included 12 steps. Uh, that coincided with the AA 12 steps, uh, man's philosophy, psychology, and um, what you could do to empower yourself to uh, be healed from alcohol. And um, I was not healed of my alcohol addiction through Celebrate Recovery at Saddleback Church. Jesus Christ healed me with my alcohol. I was healed through one step, and that one step was Jesus Christ, not a 12 step program of any sort. People who have been through AA and also with Celebrate Recovery become very much dependent on the group of people that are there. Uh, the underlying belief is that whatever it was that you abused, you're going to be subject to that for the rest of your life. And so you'll always talk about yourself as whatever your dependency was, that you're going to always carry that around with you. What Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that is any, anyone that is in Christ is a new creation. And the former things have passed away and all things become new. I believe God had every intention of wiping the slate clean on all of those things. I had addictions uh, in, in my time before Jesus set me free of them. I no longer have those addictions. Uh, he's taken them away from me, and I'm not dependent upon a group. I'm dependent upon him and the changed nature that he has offered to me. So th the problem with those is they become the new addiction in some cases. Now, I will say this. there are, I know of people that have gone to those things, and God is able to get through to those people not to become dependent upon a program but it is very much in keeping with much of what's happening in so much of the church nowadays that we've become very much program oriented we've become very much dependent on the mode and the methodology of the church rather than the truth of scripture as a member of the Saddleback Church in, um, in Lake Forest where Rick Warren is the pastor there um, I've noticed that there's so many programs to choose from. It's, it's a beautiful church. So many things to get involved in and so many things to do. And then 
I felt like no different than how it was in the motivational world. It's all about what's the next step, what's the next thing to sell. Getting people involved, you're back into the motivational world and it's being run as a business. Reading the Word of God verse by verse and understanding and teaching people to live life through Scripture and comparing their life through Scripture and backing it up through Scripture, that was not found. And it's very unfortunate, but I... Um, had, I had to stop going there because I wasn't getting the Word of God. For 2,000 years, Christians have dealt with issues of life, how to live your life in a way that is pleasing to God through the Word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Within the last hundred years, since the rise of modern psychology, that is psychotherapy, clinical psychology, psychological counseling. They have turned to people like Freud and, and Maslow and Rogers and Carl Jung for answers as to how they should live their lives. Well, these were ungodly men. These were men, as the scripture says, we're not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. None of these men were Christian. All of them were anti-Christian. Christians embracing psychology is something of an oxymoron. Psychology is based on a humanist approach that has nothing to do with biblical Christianity. It focuses on self that views man as the highest being. It was developed and proposed and promulgated by atheist humanist psychologists, most of whom were into hardcore occultism. Psychologist Carl Jung who is very famous in the world of psychology today. He was a hardcore occultist who received most of his manifestations and insights into psychology from his spirit guides. But he made it scientifically acceptable. Atheists like Sigmund Freud, who despised Christianity and wanted to have nothing to do with it, and had a humanist perspective as his foundation and base uh, for curing all psychologies, neuroses, and psychoses. When you talk about Christians embracing the belief system of hardcore occultists whose main teachings and the basic foundations were given by demons, what on earth are Christians doing thinking that they can adopt these same occult principles and Christianize it and use it for any good with their patients, especially the Christian ones. Any type of motivational um, package seminar that might seem intriguing and might be the one thing that you need to have success or, or be the answer to the thing that you're looking for. Um, I really encourage everybody to start at the beginning of the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter three where the snake deceived Eve. Deception started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And through manipulating her mind is where sin came and the destruction of the, the breaking of our relationship between us and God, which was designed to be eternal. You just always have to remember that Satan works through the mind. And any motivational guru that says that you can do it through mind science, mind psychology, that is a counterfeit. That is a red flag. M. Scott Peck wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled. We sold 8 million copies in the 80s and 90s. It was very, very important. Um, had a great impact on many, many people in the psychology field. He explained that uh, God wants us to become himself or herself or itself, that God was the collective unconscious, not a personal being, but the collective unconscious. Uh, and he got this from a man named Carl Jung, who was a, um, the founder of Jungian psychology. And Carl Jung had two spirit guides, uh, Philemon and Ka. And these spirit guides would uh, direct and guide Dr. Jung in forming his view of the collective unconscious, which you know was very close to the Hindu concept of God. The church has turned to these men, turned away from the Word of God, they believe in the inerrancy of the Word of God. Many evangelicals do. They believe in the, the authority of the Word of God. But who today believes in the sufficiency of the Word of God? As we find in, uh, in Peter's epistle, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible for 2,000 years 
in the New Testament and long before that in the Old has been seen as sufficient for dealing with the traumas and the fears and the sin in the life of people. Much of what we ascribe to these neuroses is simply selfishness, self-centeredness and sin that is dealt with by coming to the cross and looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, not applying the techniques of hardcore humanists and occultists who get their information from demons. One thing that was very revealing about M. Scott Peck was in an article, an uh, interview with him in New Age magazine, he said that he had moved from Buddhist mysticism when he wrote The Road Less Traveled to Christian mysticism, but he still retained his, uh, his Buddhist proclivities. M. Scott Peck was a very popular author and psychologist who was embraced by the Christians because he claimed to be a Christian. He believed in the reality of the spirit world when he encountered it through the uh, blatant demonic possession cases as a psychiatrist that he dealt with. And so he was convinced of the reality of the spiritual world, but he was equally convinced of the validity not only of Christianity, but of Zen Buddhism. And he practiced many of the techniques of Zen Buddhism and believed that those practices and beliefs needed to be promoted in every school in the country for any child in the fifth grade M. Scott Peck uh, said that Zen Buddhism ought to be taught in every fifth grade class in America and that Christianity's greatest sin was to think that other religions are not saved. He, the statement he made about uh, uh, Christianity's greatest sin was made after he supposedly became a Christian. So he didn't become uh, evangelical Christian, he became a, a mystical Christian or a contemplative Christian. The globalists and those who are seeking to bring in a one-world government understand one thing. You will never have your glorious one-world utopia and Garden of Eden unless you bring up the children of that generation who, with unqualified enthusiasm, accept the principles and the teachings of this one-world government that is going to be undergirded and held together by a one-world ecumenical interspiritual religion. Hitler understood that, which is why he knew he needed to raise a generation of children to embrace his Nazi socialist perspectives so that his Third Reich, which he expected to last for a glorious thousand years, would indeed last a thousand years. The school system understands the same thing, and from the very beginning, uh, of John Dewey's introduction into the school systems, a man who is viewed as the father of the modern educational system. He was a hardcore communist, a socialist. He viewed humanism as his highest goal, and in fact one is, was one of the co-authors of the Humanist Manifesto. And so he was very interested in seeing to it that the children who were now being placed under his care by the school system of this country would be raised up in perspectives that would help be the foundation of this global utopia. 